Hey, in this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing J.M. Foppel, a solo artist, and we're going to be talking a little bit about what it's like to be a solo artist and his little journey down the Japanese rabbit hole, as well as some baby metal controversy that we talk about over on the Dicotic channel. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy the video and don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share it. So I'll see you guys in the next one. We're back at it again with another interview and today's guest I have with me is J.M. Foppel. What's up, man? How's it going? Pretty good. How you doing? Oh, killing it so far. I'm, I'm doing all right. Nice, nice. Uh, can you go ahead and inter- uh, introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about what you do, who you are? Sure. Uh, my name is J.M. Foppel. I uh, am a multi-instrumentalist, uh, sometimes producer, but I release music pretty much primarily. Uh, I have a new song out called Ashes, new one coming out called I Don't Mind. Uh, recently signed with Rexius Records, and uh, basically the goal is just to make music and just keep doing cool stuff. Uh, I write early uh, music kind of akin to early 2000s alternative rock. It's just the kind of music that I grew up with, and uh, it influ- heavily influenced what I write today. Nice, man. And I can confirm everything he said because I've been working with Fobble for, <laughs> for a number of years now. So. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, this is something we like to do here is just, uh, I like to speed fire a bunch of random questions just to kind of break the ice, you know, and get, yeah. get everybody acquainted with and stuff. So, uh, what's your favorite genre of music? Uh, early, alter- early 2000s alternative rock. So it's like, it, it'd probably be called dad rock now. I've heard dad rock. Called, yeah. yeah. Dad rock is my, is my fully my jam. Nice. What's your favorite food? Pizza. What's your favorite color? Uh, it was navy blue, like the darker kind of blue, but I like royal blue a little more now. Nice. Uh, navy blue is actually my favorite color. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> would you rather write a pop album or a country album? A pop album, for sure. I, re- I like a lot of pop music, uh, especially like like Japanese pop or, or K-pop and stuff. If I could do something, if I could wrap my head around how to do that, I think I would really enjoy doing that. But country, I like some country artists and some country songs, but it's just so far away from what I what I write typically that I don't know that I do it well. True, true. I, I, I feel it. the same way. I, I think I would make a pop album much better than it would a fucking country record. Yeah. Uh, what do you would enjoy making a country album either? I, I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't even know where to begin to be honest. Yeah, exactly. All right. What's your favorite animal? Oh, I haven't thought about this in a long time. Actually, squirrels probably. Squirrels? I like squirrels. All right. That's 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 the first <laughs> that's the first I'm hearing. It, it's gone through a bunch of things. I like the typical like penguins, pandas, and stuff, but I like squirrels. Nice. Um, so earlier you mentioned about the new single, like, uh, could you tell us what was different about this single as opposed to anything else you've released? Yeah. In the past? Uh, so the difference between this one is again, it's called ashes and I collaborated with a number of people on this song. Uh, it's unique in that way that the number of collaborations on this song, as opposed to a lot of my others, it's either just working with one other person or, uh, or it's just me. This one, you can see very clearly that it features Victor Woodcock, and he's a vocalist that I've been working with for a long time on just covers, Lincoln Park covers. But uh, a mutual friend of ours, Kareem, uh, he helped in um, actually writing some of the lyrics because it wasn't my intention initially to sing on the song. So I reached out to a number of people, uh, Victor being one of them, to sing the full song. Uh, it didn't end up working for anyone that I reached out to. Uh, and it was in a waiting for a long time before Kareem just pretty much like, look, I can't, uh, here's what I have. Feel free to use what you want and stuff. And so I kept some of the stuff and, um, basically what it is, is it's different in that it still holds elements of what I typically write, like early 2000s alternative rock. But it's like the artists from that time 
what they're writing today, that's kind of what it's akin to, like involving electronic elements, synth elements, like some strings and stuff. There's no strings in this one, but I don't write with a lot of synth or traditionally haven't written with a lot of synth and stuff. And this is a very energetic song driven by like synths and uh, that kind of stuff. Nice, man. Heavy power vocals, I think, is another is another thing that I don't typically do. And and do you do most of your music by yourself, or do you kind of exclusively do like collaborators and stuff like when you're putting I really together? I typically write everything myself, but I want to involve involve collaboration as much as I can. Like early in my in my career, uh, Link, Link, the Lincoln Park covers were actually what gave me any sort of semblance of notoriety. Um, because I was apparently good at it, uh, at doing the Mike Shinoda role with Victor doing the Chester role. And I decided then that I wanted collaboration to be, I, one, it's a lot of fun. Two, uh, it, it, you kind of cross audiences and that I found that to be just be- that's There's no way that's not beneficial to me. So kind of selfishly in that sense, but it, it's just a fun experience involving other people. And it, I get stuck a lot when I write music myself. So as fun as it is creating a vision that's like, that's like been in my head, it gets stuck there a lot. And when I'm only working by myself, I'll have songs that, that don't get released for like years. You know, so I, I, it, it's fun to involve somebody else. It, it, it's, you have a sounding board. Um, so kind of a combination of the two. I would still say I mostly write things myself, but I want to eventually involve not necessarily like a band aspect, like for JM Foppel, but, uh, just collaborate as often as I can, as much as possible and stuff. Cause I think that's fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I love. I'm also a big fan of like collaborations and stuff like yeah. that. I've noticed you, you do have uh, a number of collaborators that you've done stuff with. So that's pretty cool, man. You don't you don't really see that too often. Normally, it's like bands keeping to themselves or that kind of thing. Yeah, I I really enjoyed some stuff that's happened with like Breaking Benjamin was probably like the biggest. Uh, not influence in it, but in kind of the best example I have for it, like they released an, the album, an acoustic album. They don't call it acoustic, but it's Aurora, where they just collaborated with like a bunch of artists, you know, like uh, added Goodyear from uh, three days formerly Grace. Three Days Grace. And uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, Michael Barnes from Red, and, you know, just a bunch of artists on songs they have already written, just acoustic versions of them. And I thought it was cool as heck, you know, stuff like that. So, very, very cool, man. And uh, um, with this new single you released, you released it under a label. You're signed, right? So, can you yeah. tell us a little bit about how uh, that journey of like getting signed and releasing your first single with with the label? Yeah. So that was interesting because I think I was as skeptical as anybody would be in that position. You know, uh, I get an email from someone supposedly uh, from a, a label, and I'm a nobody. You know, like I I don't have any songs that are, I think I have like maybe one or two songs that are above a thousand streams, and so I I'm just like who who reaches out to me? You know that kind of thing. And but I I I did my research, I did my due diligence, and just started a conversation, and. I ended up in conversation with, like I mentioned, Rexius Records. And I think what kind of the biggest difference between before I signed and when I signed with them is I felt motivation that I had lost somewhere along the way the past few years. Like I've, I mentioned that I write songs and like I just like get stuck and stuff like that. But I've been at Ashes is not a song that I wrote within the past few weeks within the past few months this song is like at least a couple of years old at least if not more so one thing that has been has i've really benefited from from getting signed is just kind of internally refreshing that motivation because i had deadlines 
kind of loose deadlines, just to be clear, but there was things that needed to be done. So I made sure that I got them done, but that meant like putting pressure on the people that I was working with, um, like, you know, my producer, just making sure we could get together that we could record that with like, you know, mixing is getting done that I'm, that I have all the elements and stuff. Um, and that's something that I had lost at some point. I wasn't as super hyper-focused on it. I kind of like didn't put any pressure on myself or the people that I was working with to, you know, get things done and stuff. And I've, I think I've regained that is probably the biggest difference between not being signed and, and since having been signed. Uh, as far as ashes, of course, there's benefits to like, you know, a number of resources that I don't have myself. That's what I've noticed on that end. But I, I really wanted to touch on kind of the internal difference if that's made for for me. Just, well, so so just drawing that out a little more. So it, it's kind of it's kind of been a unique experience and kind of surreal because like I mentioned, like who I'm I'm nobody who reaches out to me. So it was it was affirming, like it, there was a sense of vindication that yeah, you know, there was people who liked my music, people that had had heard my music and, and liked my music because it wasn't just that when I was having a conversation with the label, um, you know, with my contact, with my now contact, they were able to point out specific parts of songs that they enjoyed. Like, so it wasn't just getting numbers into the fold, just trying to get money out of people or, or trying to exploit them or anything like that. I was having a conversation with someone who had heard my songs and could tell me why they liked them in a way that I could understand, uh, which, I mean, if nothing else made me feel good, you know, so, uh, so yeah, that was, uh, that was good. And what's the name of the label, by the way? A label? Rexius Records. Was that? Say it again, sorry? Rexius Records. They're a Swedish label. Ah, okay, okay, cool, cool. You don't find it difficult to like keep up commu communications because of the time different thing. It's 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 weird. It's definitely weird because uh, I I don't know re really remember what the time difference is. It might be like seven or eight hours. I think most of Europe is seven. Some parts are uh, six or eight. Um, but particularly, this came into play when I was releasing my music video. I I did the music video fully myself. And I didn't send them the link, the, the pre-save link or the, or the, you know, the live link or anything like that preview. And so I get an email from the label, Hey, congrats on the release. Can you send us the link? And by the time I see that, cause they're sending that probably at close of day on Thursday, cause it's coming out the next day, uh, or they're sending it out on Friday for them. Uh, well, I read that when I wake up in the morning. And so that's like seven or eight for me. And it's already like end of day, end of business day for them. So I, I sent them the email as just like, you know, it, it's not even, <laughs> it's not even a thing at that point. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it can be, it, it hasn't caused any problems, but it can, it's just weird. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, did they have any input in the song? What, like, as you were preparing it and stuff like, did they listen back and be like, Oh, this sounds too, I don't know, too poppy or whatever. Like, did they have any kind of input like that on it? Yeah. Not as far as direction. Uh, they, they were, they made it pretty clear from the beginning. They didn't want to be, uh, they didn't want to tell me which direction to go with songs. But if I had specific questions, if I had tone concerns or anything like that, they'd be happy to provide feedback and stuff. Um, they obviously wanted, mixes and masters to be like of quality and stuff but as far as the song itself it was pretty much it was pretty pointed feedback it was like hey what do you think of this uh in one part in particular of the next out uh, next song that's coming out uh, i don't mind there's one segment that i wasn't sure if it should be high past or not because it really makes a difference to the tone of the song uh or to like the the kind of the feel of the song in one part and i just asked them was like hey a or b what do you think and they they gave feedback on that and stuff so 
but yeah, as far as the direction of the song, this sounds too poppy. This, we don't like this. Yeah. There was none of that. Okay, cool. And, uh, you also released a music video for the song. Did you receive any kind of assistance with that or was, or was that all on you? Uh, I didn't ask for any assistance on it. So there might have been, there could have been, but I, I think I took on the challenge really early and, and didn't, it never occurred to me to ask for help if I'm really honest. So like I got help with the filming cause it was during the photo shoot of ashes, but it, it never occurred to me to reach out to them and say like, Hey, what do you think of this? Or, you know, is there anything that we could do for this or anything like that? It actually never occurred to me. No, oh, uh, you should have man. probably would have I know. chipped in, a bit, give you some yeah. extra knowledge or whatever, but <laughs> that's cool that you did it on your own though. I mean, yeah, you only, it's a learning experience. You only, you know, uh, yeah, it, it was definitely, cause I mean, it's an editing project too along with it, it's scouring through, I think what ended up being like three hours of footage. Oh, geez. Uh, and just, and condensing it down to like five minutes. Cause the song was five minutes long condensing it down to five minutes worth of music video, uh, footage, which is one playthrough. We got one video of me singing it and the rest of it is just B roll from the photo shoot. Oh, uh, wait, did you edit it yourself? Yeah. Oh shit. Oh, damn. I thought you cut somebody to edit it for you. No. That was pre- that's th- pretty good. That's pretty good. I, yeah, I've seen the music video and I, I thought the whole thing was pretty good, man. But yeah, good job on the on the video and uh, credit to to Victor as well <laughs> on the yeah. uh, on the release. Um, let's talk about you've recently gone down the the rabbit hole of the Japanese stuff. Like, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> how's that been for you? And do you think it's it, it's impacted any any of your like songwriting and these newer songs oh man i wish it did i would really like it to because there's some there's some j-pop that is just so cool I, and i think you've reacted to a few of them that really interest me but uh man i would love to be able to get like clean like impact base that you get from like j-pop songs and incorporate that into uh heavy rock and metal segments and stuff like that would be so cool uh i think it's just too familiar too unfamiliar of a of kind of a music production style for me to like immediate immediately be be doing it or, or uh effectively be incorporating it because it's still fairly new to me i think i only started listening like maybe two three years ago Mm-hmm. And that's like dipping my toe in. I'd only say I'm really now kind of immersed in it. Um, some of the bands I think I would like to kind of incorporate into my writing or be like second action real. Uh, those are probably the two that I would really love to align my sound or like inflict, allow influence the kind of things that I, uh, that I write. But so far I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't say that I'm incorporating anything in my recent writing or anything like that. Although I do have one idea for a Japanese song. And if there happens to be any, uh, Japanese singers that would want to collaborate, I think I have an idea for a song. So you heard it, you heard it here first folks <laughs> hit them up for a collab. Yeah. If you're from Japan, um, and I mean, not even subconsciously either. Like a, a lot of the times that happens when you like learn a new song or, or something like that, you subconsciously add elements into your stuff, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I subconsciously, I would probably say so. Like, I, I, I think just the starting places of where I do certain things, uh, would probably be kind of influenced by that, but it hasn't gone super far. I think it, it, it would only be subconscious. Uh, I think if it was influenced. Ah, okay, cool, cool, cool. And what are some other bands that you've you know delved down the rabbit hole? What are some of your favorite like Japanese bands? Ooh, so the, I already mentioned two of them. Like Second Action is probably my favorite Japanese band, and they're kind of J-pop. They're kind of J-rock, kind of J-pop, uh, but they cover a wide range of genres. 
Um, Rayol is an electronic pop artist and she, her music is wild. It, it's so crazy to follow and stuff like that. But if other people want other bands, um, Gesu no Kiwami Otome is another one. Uh, you may have reacted to some of their stuff. Um, the name doesn't ring a bell, but we might have maybe. Right. I think at least three of you have. I remember one real song that you have. Yeah. Um, real, we definitely did. Yeah. Uh, other Japanese bands that I really like are uh, probably more more kind of mainstream one is uh polka dot stingray oh they're great i love them yeah and um uh kanabun they've gotten they've done some some anime intros and some outros and stuff and then probably the big one the most popular the two most popular most people have probably heard of are uh kenshi Yunes. uh he did the chainsaw man intro and uh and lisa I don't know if that's how you say her name, but Lisa, she did the, you know, the Demon Slayer intro and uh, a lot more than that. But she's pretty much the queen of anime intros. Yeah. Point, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and, and and I don't know that I follow Lisa so much other than probably the anime intros. But the the three that I probably listen to the most are probably Second Action, Lorel, and um, Kenshi and S. Those are probably my my big three, I guess. Nice. And, and what do you think of Baby Metal? I like baby metal. It, it's it's probably not what I reach for immediately on the Japanese music front or on the metal front, but it's nice that there is that uh, that there is that segmentation. You know that there is that um, there is where those two places meet. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I like I I watched their first take. I'm a big fan of first take, uh, so I watched them. So like when it's on, I'll watch it if it comes across my playlists. Like. I'll listen, but I don't think there's any instance in which I'll be like, I'm going to go listen to baby metal. That's fair. Is it, is it except actually for, except for the one, I really like the one. The ones are great. So well, they have a bunch of good songs, but uh, anyway, there's, there's this topic I wanted to talk to you about regarding baby metal. And, okay. and you got, it was like a very heated topic that kind of pissed us off. Between who? Huh? Between who? Uh, there's this podcast channel, like a heavy metal podcast channel uh, type thing where he went on this feel about like how baby metal fans are all pedos and stuff, how their demographics, a bunch of like older dudes and stuff. And it's just like, it rubbed us all the wrong way. Cause it's just like, we know we're not pedos. Like the music's just good. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just the fact that they're, you know, three girls dancing to metal that like, you know, so, so what do you think about, about stuff like that? I, I, I would think, well, okay, baby metal is probably the wrong place to be making that kind of argument because you could be making a, a much stronger argument for K-pop, uh, if that was the case. Cause like, I think new jeans, even their youngest member is like, oh, I don't know if is, but when they debuted, I think their youngest was like 16 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's one group called young posse that, uh, I think are all 16 or something like that. And, uh, so I think if you were going to point the finger, make that argument, there's a much better place to be making that argument and that would be K-pop. But I don't think that's the case. Like you are I think you're allowed to like something without it saying anything about like as a person or that would have probably applied to most things. And I, I think baby metals absolutely in that realm, you can like baby metal just because of the music. Like you'd like, uh, first off baby metal is probably the first four rate. A lot of people have into, uh, Japanese music, uh, into, a, into metal probably in general, just because it's a very, you would think it's very kind of not not novel, novelty is the wrong word, but it's the only thing I could think of at this point. That like your friend shows you is like, hey, listen to this, and you'd be like, I've never heard this before. That's pretty cool, and that could be a foray into uh, either into metal or Japanese music. Uh, so I I don't agree with that 
at all. Well, I mean, you mentioned the idol stuff. Uh, he actually didn't mention that as well, like how baby metal is kind of part of the idol industry and the idol industry is pretty fucked when it comes to like, you know, se sexualizing these younger girls and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I, think, I still think there's, I still think there's better places to, to be putting that blame. And I don't, I still don't think that baby metal falls into that category because, um, yes, I, I think you, I don't want, well, not your channel specifically, but you know, there are people like react channels and stuff are part of the way that baby metal, um, exists is because of a lot of live performances. Like, you know, when you're showing your friend, you show them videos, you don't just like pull up Spotify and they listen to this. Um, but you can listen to baby metal like on Spotify and it'd still be good if you like it and stuff. It doesn't have to be about sexualizing a, you know, a, anything. Yeah. You know, and uh, K-pop in general, that I'm fully going to acknowledge that exists in the industry. Probably I'm not in it, but I mean, we're adults. We're aware of things that happen in the world and stuff that um, it's probably a terrible atmosphere, but it's really good music, not but, and it's really good music. <laughs> Those two things probably exist in the same space. Um, so, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with liking baby metal. And I don't think that says anything about anyone's character that they do like baby metal. <laughs> Sweet. Because it felt kind of, well, Alan felt really weird about it. He said he walked into like Guitar Center wearing a baby metal shirt after he had seen that video. And he was just like, oh, shit, I feel like I'm a pedal right now. Like, you know. Even though it's not, it's not remotely who he is, you know? Yeah. But. I, I think that's, it's a weird, I, I could understand how someone would feel weird about it, but I think there, you could say, I mean, you could, I don't know where I'm going with that. I, I don't think there's anything to feel weird about, but I, I, I get the kind of thought process that would take you there. I wouldn't say there's anything to worry about, though. I, I don't feel bad about liking, um, like J-pop or, or K-pop music and stuff like that. And part of it, I will admit, is I don't watch a lot of music videos, but I enjoy it when I do, and it has nothing to do with. Um, uh, hopefully, it has nothing to do with me being a pet. <laughs> So don't, don't, don't feel like a pedal. Got it. Good yeah. Advice. Don't feel like a pedal. <laughs> uh, moving on. Uh, where do you see yourself like in five years? Oh, where do I see? I see, I think five years is always really unrealistic. It's it, like, it, it's, you reach a point where like you, I don't know. I've always think, I always thought that five years is real, really unrealistic. But if I take two years, I think I can see that. And then I'll just double that, I guess. Uh, in two years, I would like to just release more music, more kind of automatically, like to the point where like it's so ingrained in me that it's just a part of my life, you know, that like I set aside X amount of time, X amount of money for recording and stuff like that. But in five years, I would like all of that to have some sort of payoff, if I'm honest. Like, it's fun making music for me. And I like to say, I think all artists like to say that we make music for ourselves. And if people like it, cool. Having said that, I think it would be nice. And I would like my goal would be to see a payoff from that, like either from building a community of people who like my music or, you know, financially of it increasing, like playing a part of my income and stuff. Like I want in five years to be able to like, look at my music career and be like, not just feel good about it from a sense of like accomplishment from like, this is, I'm getting my music out. I'm having fun doing this stuff, but also like looking at it and saying like, I've, achieved something you know yeah yeah 
and like um well i mean that's how you build it up you know what i mean it's, it's the consistency and like releasing new music and stuff like that and marketing it properly and stuff like that so hopefully hopefully it, it does work out for you you know yeah. Yeah, i hope so too yeah <laughs> And um, any plans for for touring now that you got the the single and the label backing and stuff like that? Do you have any plans for touring or anything? It'd be difficult. I'll be real honest. I'm a diva when it comes to performing. So like I I've thought long and hard about this, and I think the only way that I'm going on like a national tour is like going full scope with like roadies and people like packing up and putting away and stuff like that. Basically all I do is show up. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be expensive though. I know because I, because like I said, I'm a diva when it comes to it, but setting up and tearing down, I hate it. It's the worst part of touring. Like aside from like touring, aside of like driving from place to place, basically all the logistics, all the logistics of touring sucks. Yeah. And I, if I can help it, I don't want a part of it. So it would, uh, I don't mind doing it. I'm sure there would be a scenario where I would, uh, where I would absolutely tour. Uh, I, I love performing. I love, uh, I love the performance aspect of music and stuff, but, um, I, I am that diva. <laughs> so I mean, when you're be, the vocalist though, like, I know the vocalist never helps. It's like the, the meme, everybody knows this. Yeah, but uh, it would probably, well, I mean, I write all my songs probably with, um, to if, well, if it's going to be a, you know, a little cheaper, I write, I would, I would be playing guitar, you know, instead of hiring uh, another guitarist to play with me. But that would be another aspect is find, finding touring musicians because uh, JM Foppel is not, you know, a, a band with a one person name. It is just me. Um, so I would need, I would probably need to find people to tour with me, uh, touring musicians and stuff. And that, uh, gets tricky, uh, for performance aspect, financial aspect and stuff like that. So, uh, there, there are, I'm sure there exists scenarios in which I could and would, uh, but I, I don't have any plans to. Okay. Cool. Cool. What about shows in general? Like, no show. Yeah, I, I've I've done a couple. I didn't do any this year, but like last year I did. Uh, last year I did a couple of shows, and it was basically with a drummer, uh, a couple of backing tracks, and I was by playing guitar also. Uh, and those were really fun. Those were actually like the first performances that I did uh, in at least a couple of years, and I had a lot of fun doing them. I got to play some of my older songs. That uh, you know that were from the Still Breathing album and some of the stuff that will be coming out and uh, a couple of covers and stuff as well. But I had a lot of fun uh, just playing. They were they were local shows. They were local venues and stuff. But I had a lot of fun. So if uh, I just need to to kind of get a get more of a repertoire and people that I can play with because it, it is more fun playing with people than playing with backing tracks. How'd you set up the backing tracks? Did you just like kind of play them out of your computer and hope for the best or? Uh, kind of on, on one show, there was a split where you could run, uh, a track to that they had kind of the equivalent of an in-ear system. Mm -hmm. And so that one, that one wasn't a problem. We had one set of songs with like a click, uh, that we played along to. And then the other venue was pretty much just the drummer, like with his earphones in playing to playing to a, a quick version of the, of the song. And I had to rely on him and, and my, my monitor. Oh, wow. so it, it, yeah. So it was. Uh, one of them was really tricky, but the other one was was set up for that kind of thing. Cool. And um, what are some what are some artists that you really really wish you could collaborate with? Ooh, 
Well, I I mean, like dream scenario, I'd love to collaborate with like Ricky Benjamin, just like my my favorite artist. They've been my favorite artist for absolute years and stuff. But it's like people that I think it would be really cool to collaborate with um, would be uh, Kevin Madison from formerly Evans Blue, now with Parabell. Uh, I think he's lyrically and vocally, he's been a heavy influence on uh, on some of my music. And I think it would be really cool to, to collaborate with him. Uh, and Mike Shinoda is probably the other one that I, another kind of dream scenario. And one that if I actually, if I actually had a choice between Ricky Benjamin and Mike Shinoda, I would, Mike Shinoda just does so much uh in so many different genres and it seems like like his brain just works at a uh, hundred miles a minute like any anything you could think of in your head he's already thought of it and then some so it, it would be really cool to just like be in the same room as him as he's creating you know that's a good one i, I really really like mike shinoda yeah and ben and breaking benjamin but it, like with breaking benjamin it might just be like It'll sound very, very Breaking Benjamin-y, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think that that's why I would choose Mike Shinoda if I had, if, if it was like one or the other, obviously I would still love both, but Mike Shinoda, there's just so much, there are so many genres. There's just not anything defining Mike Shinoda. And uh, yeah, you're right. Breaking Benjamin sounds like Breaking Benjamin. And I feel like I'm so heavily influenced by Breaking Benjamin that it would just go in that direction anyway. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Kevin Madison, uh, and Mike Shinoda would be, I think, great collaborations to have, or the Japanese artists I mentioned Ray, would be insane. Cause I, I can't imagine what we would come up with. That'd be so fun. That would be crazy. There's, there's actually a point where we almost collab with a, a Chinese artist from Hong Kong. Really? Yeah. We hit her up. I don't know if she was joking, but like. We, we said we should do something together and she was like she said she was down we never really got back to her on on that but that would have been interesting to see you absolutely should that's so cool yep um what do you think the state of the music industry is right now like it, i've gotten a lot of mixed answers about this one some people say it's the best it's ever been some other people say it's it sucks like you know uh, well, I think there's a couple of ways to look at that. I think one way to look at it is that there's more accessibility to creating and releasing than there ever has been. But with that, there's uh, more. There's a lot more competition. Yeah. So oversaturation things. Uh, yeah. Starting to there's become. A, absolutely that. So I, I like. In in terms of in terms of being able to put out music, there's almost no excuse at this point for people to for like if you want to write music, there's almost no excuse at this point for you not doing so, for not relief, for not writing it, producing it, releasing it and stuff. Because there's so much like the all of the equipment is consumer grade now. Uh all and the education is so accessible so i mean with with like less than a thousand dollars probably you could get a working studio basic but a working studio uh able to pay for distribution and the education to at least like bare minimum get it out there yep. you know so and that's, i'm not even talking about like university stuff or or because uh, like you could buy courses like master classes you could buy um, like nail the mix esque stuff. So in that sense, the music industry is fantastic. But there, are, like Spotify, just had a thing, and it, does, it doesn't really apply to it. Doesn't really affect. Well, it, it's going to affect a lot of people because if you have less than a thousand streams, I think you don't get payouts anymore. Uh, and granted that a thousand streams nets you like four cents or four dollars or something like that. I can't remember the math, but uh it's it's tricky because 
with the digital platforms, I think the conversation has always been that artists aren't getting paid like they used to. Yep. And uh, like Disturbed had a, this was probably like 15 years ago, Disturbed made a comment that it is, they don't, not that they don't care, but it's neither here nor there that their music is downloaded so much kind of illegally like torrent and stuff like that because they make all their money off of live performances you know so like that's how they rely on things red i don't know how it affects their their sales or anything like that but they're they're touring like two they used to tour 200 out of 200 days out of like a 365 day year so i mean it's I think money is always going to be in the conversation when it comes to the music industry, like the artists themselves getting paid and who's, if, if they're getting a fair cut and stuff, if they are, I don't really know the answer to that, but I think that at the very minimum, the bare minimum, that possibility, that conversation has expanded a lot. The people who have access to that money, that payout, that audience um has widened greatly and i mean there's also like like, like all those uh i mean continuing on the money stuff like you know the cost of touring is higher than it's ever been and all that kind of stuff going around too like you don't really see many like local bands or like smaller bands touring like it's all it's only going to be the big bands that you're seeing you know what i mean so it's kind of yeah. shitty in that sense the, the other band i interviewed before you brought that up and now i was just like oh like you know i never really thought about that that aspect but okay. i think a lot of people now like pomplamoose has a video they put up that they lost money touring and it's a very controversial video because you have a lot of people like sleep in the van kind of stuff, but they're providing hotel rooms for all their hired musicians and for, you know, for themselves and stuff like that. So it's, it's tricky putting together a tour and you kind of have to decide like what you're willing to accommodate for yourself and for what you're willing to put up with. So yeah, you could sleep in the van and this is just an example, but you could sleep in the van to save some money. But I, I don't think that saving money, when it, in terms of touring, I don't think saving money is making you any <laughs> like if you're if you have to save. Um, I don't I don't fully know where I was going with that, but I don't I don't think you're making a lot of money off of touring if you're uh, saving money by sleeping in a bed. I mean, you're saving a little bit of money, and like it's not. I mean, but it's more about saving money, not that you're not making money at that point. True, true. Indeed. And um, I mean, on the opposite side of that, too, there's also, I mean, well, not the opposite side, but like a different aspect of the music industry is that everybody's a little bit more open now to like metal. Everybody's more willing to accept the heavier genres and like actually be like, oh, you know what? This is so bad. Yeah, I think so. I think that, that that kind of access is it it plays a part in that sense as well because where most people got a lot of their music was uh you know radio stations and stuff and it was basically what the DJ did. they they had like rotations and there was some kind of syndication at that point but a lot of it was what the DJ wanted to play. Um and uh now, as an example, Spotify, you have every artist right next to each other. Yep. And to just discover weekly, you have like algorithms and stuff like tailoring people's preferences, discovering new artists. Um, I mean, you can leave it on play. I, I, there's been times like I've, I've left, uh, I've left it on YouTube and I'm discovering artists that, I would not have found on my own. And uh, actually how I got into the Japanese music was I was listening to Bluebird, uh, the, the, oh, the no, Naruto like, intro. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and I didn't exit out of it because I was doing something else and it just kept playing. And then I found some 
you know, I found music that I would have would have not continued listen to listening to otherwise. So yeah, the scope of music that is just like so accessible, so readily accessible uh, to anybody is it, it yeah incredible. Nice. Uh, you know, I think reactions might play a factor into that too. I mean, not necessarily what we do, but like uh, the hip hop guys listening to to rock, I think definitely gets you, people you, into that mentality of opening up, you know? Yeah. I think I've mentioned this to you. I think like, we've done a podcast on this or something like that. I've met, I brought it up, but something I'm obsessed with is finding react videos to performances that I like. So like uh, David Townsend at the Grand Royal, uh, the Albert Royal Hall is it? a performance of Deadhead. I live off of finding reaction videos to that video. <laughs> that and like his kingdom performance at with EMG TV. Like I, I, I will a sole section of my YouTube viewing activity is react reaction videos of that video. <laughs> of, of like certain videos that's a good one just seeing the shock on people's faces once he starts actually singing it's like yeah I, I live for that kind of stuff too even songs we reacted to like certain parts that we went crazy on or raved about like i kind of look up other people's reactions to it yeah to see if they felt the same way as us yeah and if, if it's that it, i get why reaction videos are so popular so you're looking for like vindication you're looking for sympathy like like uh you're looking validation for, you, yeah yeah you're looking for that mutual feeling that community yeah you know, I, I mean there's so many types of reactions too i mean music reactions co yeah. comedy sketch reactions and all that stuff so i mean it's another another rabbit hole to go down yeah and uh i don't know would you, would you invest in, in in a reaction have people reacting to your music and stuff like that i i it's not something I, i've considered actually but i wouldn't mind doing so like that's not an investment that's above me that i that i think is like played out or anything like that i would do so if i thought it i think the condition for i, I wouldn't want to do it as a marketing strategy i would want to do it as I want to see how this particular person reacts to this particular song, like my particular song. Um, I think that's the context in which I would want to do it. Otherwise, I would feel kind of icky. <laughs> yeah, I think um, like uh, there, there's not really any reactors that I really follow. Like I mentioned, it's like more specific videos, but um but if there was a reactor that I, that I, whose reaction I was really after, that I was really interested in seeing, I think that's something I would, I would want to do. I would be interested in doing. It definitely has to be the right person too. You can't just pick any little reactor to react to it and yeah. hope for the best, you know, it has to be something along the lines and it has to be small enough too, where you can actually pay them to react to your song. Yeah. But. Uh, I think that's all the questions I've got, man. Hey, Foppel, thanks so much for be doing this interview with me, man. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, man. And, uh, thanks for having yeah. me on. You want to shout out anything, you know, other? Uh, sure. Um, I have a music video out. I have a song out of the same song, but it's uh, Ashes featuring Victor Whitcomb is my newest uh, song. I have a new song called I Don't Mind coming out on uh, December 8th. So not this coming Friday, but next uh, so check it out if you're on the page. All right, cool. I'll wrap up this interview. Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you guys in the next one. See you later.